Hello and welcome to the Player to Prospect podcast. The following episode features a conversation with Paul Janish, an assistant coach and recruiting coordinator at Rice University. To support the podcast, all follows, ratings, and reviews are appreciated. And now I present to you Paul Janish. I'm very interested to ask what aspects of your playing career you've put into your coaching career. What are the things that you that you like to take from your playing career and put into your coaching career? Uh, sort of philosophy or approach yeah so it's you know it's kind of a different question relative to the college level versus the pro level um Mm -hmm. you know historically a lot most of my playing career recent memory was was at the pro level right and you know had Mm -hmm. the opportunity to to play longer than I would have ever imagined and you know what translates to me I think the biggest thing is probably communication you know we could Mm -hmm. we could we could talk about how to field a ground ball or like how you know, I saw people hit really well or whatever the case is, but I think in particular at the college level where you're dealing with a younger athlete, obviously, um, I think the element of communication is, is huge, especially in, you know, we can say whatever we want about this day and age or kids these days or whatever, but like at the end of the day, like it's our job to make them play as good as they can play. Um, you know, mm-hmm. my college, my college coach was, a, was an older school guy that was really firm and hard on us and you know, we responded, don't get me wrong. And I love them, respect them still do to this day. But I do Mm -hmm. think that there's a a, more of a premium put on, you know, maybe doing a little bit more explanation with regards to trying to help the kids understand the guys, the players understand where we're coming from. And, you know, if I get pissed off and I start yelling why I'm doing that, right. (laughs) Versus, versus just like, just trying to, you know, ambush them, so to speak, with with uh, some 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 choice words. I, I think that uh, I think that, that the communication goes a long way, and it it helps everybody to understand where they stand, whether they whether they like it or not, or whether that's an uncomfortable conversation. I think I think them knowing where they stand in the long term helps them. I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you're not the only coach who has pointed out that sort of shift and how coaches have to communicate with their players, and that's interesting because I've noticed that as well. Um, not only as a player, but just watching other coaches and how they have to approach things too. Um, so would you say that started when you were a coach? Did, did you have to make that shift as a coach as well? Or did that start when you were a player? Yeah, so as a player, but I, I think it's just one of those things that, you know, when I was playing and, and it's, again, the pro level is a different dynamic. I think we can all understand that, but there's very little communication historically in that industry. And like, don't get me wrong. I haven't been at the pro level in an organization in, in that capacity in, in about, in about five years. So like maybe it's getting better or whatever, but um, I just remember when I played a lot of the dialogue between players was kind of complaining, joking, but complaining, so to speak about um, the lack of communication and not knowing where you stand and, you know, that type mm-hmm. of thing. And, and, yeah. and that is more where that, I guess, thought process came from. And then being at the college level, it, it is, Again, it's a different dynamic. I want everybody to play good and, and get drafted and go play in the big leagues. Obviously, we know that's not going to be the case. But so at this level, it's there's 100% more of a mentor element into from a life standpoint than just a baseball standpoint. Um, yeah, which which I appreciate and enjoy, and it drives me crazy all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you guys implement like better communication strategies, like at Rice, because I agree. It's very important. I mean, we're talking about the subject right now. Yeah. So it's, it, to me, it starts, uh, you know, I'd, it starts on the recruiting front, to be honest. It's uh, I joke about it with rice specifically. I mean, I went to rice and it's the only place I've ever worked at in college at the college level. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very cool place and a very unique place. So like it's the best way to, for me to say it is I, I and I tell parents this, I tell kids this on recruiting visits when we're driving around our campus and the whole thing, but you know, I'm really not trying to trick anybody into coming here. You know, I really mm-hmm. try to be pretty transparent with regards to who we are. So when you're asking me about when does the communication or how do we implement it, it starts from prior to even being on campus, right? So that, you know, when, when you get here, you know, college kids are going to have the infrastructure of being at home and they're leaving home. And so when they get here and it's, they're a freshman, in, in theory, they're going to, when they're uncomfortable, they're going to call home, right? And so I want I want mom and dad to be on the same page that we're on with regards to you know, the way that we go about things, what rice is. Yes, we're an academic institution that's going to set you up for life. And, 
I'm going to try and make you good at baseball and hopefully you get to play on TV. And if you don't, I can promise you, you're probably going to end up being in a financial situation that's better than the guys that do. So mm. um, all, all that to say, it, it starts from the very beginning. When they get here on campus, I think I've adopted a little bit of the mantra with using a freshman XYZ as the example. And instead of waiting for too long to to kind of try to set the tone with regards to what we need from him over the course of time, we just I kind of joke about it just punch him in the face with it that freshman fall and say look man this is who we're going to need you to be this is who I think you can be but I can't do it for you you know those kinds of things mm-hmm. but again you just try to do the best you can to expedite the process and mm-hmm. in hopes that that it, that it works faster than it you know they get better sooner than than later but at the same time we all know there's just some variables at hand that that are that they have to adjust to and there's no way to do it other than to go through it you know yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I, mean, I like what you're talking about. It really is about building that trust, right? As soon as you can build that trust with the player, you can get them to buy in to what you're saying too. I mean, the doors just, you know, it blows wide open, like for all the opportunities to come in. Right. I mean, I obviously, you know, you've seen this. I know I've seen this players who just don't want to buy into the team. You know, they, they're kind of pushing back. They think that their coach doesn't have their best interests in mind. Um, and then they end up, you know, kind of just being a little bit of an afterthought because they're not, they're not committed. They don't trust their coaches. Like, how do you guys like really make sure that you, you buy your, like have your players buy in and trust what you guys are putting, you know, in, into the practice? Yeah. So that's, that's a moving target, man. You know, with 18 Mm -hmm. to 22 year old males, you're, uh, there's again to kind of reiterate with regards to variables there's a lot of things that guys go through whether that's family stuff whether Mm -hmm. you know joking but like you know guys fall in love and out of love and you know Mm -hmm. then you got school and you know there's all this stuff and then cohen said that with the fact that now you implement the transfer portal right so you got guys that have that have been in different spots and experienced different things and and i think that's what we benefit from right now is is you know, we got a new head coach last summer, and so this is we're going mm-hmm. into year number two technically with our new head coach. And um, you know, we're trying to make a point to to be a little bit more of a relationship based, rapport based mm. pl- place, right? And we've gotten a lot of really good positive feedback from some of our players that have been at other places where you know they're bigger schools, so to speak. They bring in more guys, and there's more a little bit more of a churn rate with regards to. You know, you can bring in 20 to 25 guys and then send out 15 and then bring in 20, 25 guys and bring it, you know what I mean? So there's just a lot more turnover at those places. We're, we're trying to, you know, create a situation where we are who we are and guys want to be here. And they, and to your point mm-hmm. about buy, buying in, it's, it, it's that a lot of that I think comes from within that locker room. And so you need to get, you need to get the guys on board and have them quote unquote trust you and, I think the best way to do that in a lot of cases is to just be pretty transparent. And mm-hmm. it's, it's easy for me to say that hard to accomplish it, but, um, and then somewhere chicken or the egg deal, you got to have some success, right? So you got to have some guys that the guys that are bought in, you need them to have success so that the other guys that are kind of on the fence are looking around saying, well, you know, that, okay, I see it. I, I can see it, feel it, you know, taste mm-hmm. it, so to speak. And, and it, and then and then you hope you create a snowball that starts rolling down the hill a little bit. And, I, and I'm hoping that that's kind of where we are right now in year two of, you know, you know we got our feet on the ground. I think and we got some players with some with a chip on their shoulder that are that are that are talented that have the ability to 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 do well. And we just need them to start doing well if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you bring up a lot of good points. I want to kind of circle back to your head coach, uh, mm-hmm. who's entering his second season. Can you elaborate? Just tell me a little bit about like what he brings to the team in terms of just like his on-field presence, you know, his day-to-day kind of just like role? Yeah, so Jose Cruz Jr. is our head coach, right? He obviously had a mm-hmm. pretty pretty successful professional career, college career, baseball career, right, all-encompassing. From Houston, played at Rice as well. I, I mean, I played at Rice as well, so we're kind of unique on that front in mm-hmm. terms of having two former alumni on staff. Um, and But he, he, he comes from a little bit more of the world of – uh, obviously with the pro background it's uh it's a little bit more um i, I guess i you, you could compare it to like a, pro, a little bit more of a pro setup but but at the end of the day it's we try to do the best we can to focus on the things that matter you know he's he's an offensively minded guy and so like a, a lot of from a daily standpoint when you're asking that a lot of that is cage time you know he he really enjoys being in the cage with the guys like you know, doing, doing a lot of that type of 
grinding, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from a practice plan standpoint, a lot of that falls on myself and, and, and our other coaches, but that being said, he, um, it's, it's, it's not hard to see when you're, when you're in his office or on our field or on our campus on a visit, you know, the, again, going back to reiterate the, the passion that he has for rice specifically is, is unique. You know what I mean? It's just, it's something that it's, it's kind of in the, in the DNA, so to speak, being from close, mm-hmm. having played here, being so connected with our alumni network, which at a small private institution is a pretty big deal relative to raising money and that, and those kinds of things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and again, going back to it, more of a relationship guy, he's not at this juncture, he's not going to be the, the coach that's going to, you know, verbally assault the players and, 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 and the way that some of us joke about some of the older school guys. Right. And, but again, going back to it in this, with, with the current landscape, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of good to that with regards to creating rapport with the players. You just need to make sure that they, we need to make sure that they understand too, like, Hey, there's some accountability involved here. I'm not necessarily just, I'm, I'm not trying to be your friend now. Let's not get it. Let's not get it mixed. Right. Yeah. We, uh, I care about you and I want you to do good, but at the same time, we're going to make sure you know if, if if you're not holding up your end of the bargain, you know. Right, right. Was that difficult for you to do maybe in your first year of coaching um, to kind of separate from being, you know, the player's friend to to like a coach, like kind of drawing that line? Yeah, I think that that's just one of those things that you adapt over the course of time. And, you know, my, my college mm-hmm. coach, who I talk to even still to this day, and we, we I worked for him for a year here and you know, one of the things that he said very, uh, very explicitly was like, the longer you coach, the meaner you'll get, right? <laughs> um, and so there's some truth to that with regards to, but again, it goes back to expectation. You just realize that you're not doing them any favors by letting them slip by. And, you know, mm. the, every, every day that you let them get away with something that you know you saw, but you think, well, I'm just, well, they'll, 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 they'll get better. They'll figure it out. Well, they're not going to get better. And they're not going to figure it out unless you tell them, you know what I mean? Mm. Um and I have a unique perspective too, because I have three kids of my own at, at, at the house in the fifth grade, fourth grade, first grade, and, you know, dealing with, you know, as a coach, dealing with the guys at the college level, it, it influences the way that I actually even parent my kids. Right. Cause hmm. again, again, it just makes you more direct. It makes you more, you know, I, I'm serious right now kind of thing. And um, hmm. all, all of those things are productive. So when you say that, yes, the answer is yes. It takes a second you know, to make that adjustment of, of, of being a little firmer with them and being comfortable with it. And then yeah. ult- ultimately understanding like that's actually, we're, we're, we're doing them a favor. I'm, I'm helping mm-hmm. them by doing that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it, again, it, it's a different line, but it's a very fine line where, you know, you might need to get after player. You might not need to light a fire, you know, in them and uh, you don't want them to push back and kind of uh, shy away from that. Right. But there's something that's been added in recent years that I think is helping with that. And that is technology because players, at least today, they seem to like understand or they're able to grasp things like things that they're doing wrong, maybe things they need to work on when they can see it in front of them, the data, the technology, whatever it may be. Now for you, do you like to use that stuff and kind of say like, okay, here we go. Like, this is, this is the problem. Like, this is how you're going to solve it. This is what we need to change. Or do you like to lean a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say old school, but more like feel based kind of eye test sort of esque? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a balance, right? You know, my, yeah. the, my nature is to be, is to trust my eyes and be a little bit more, you know, have, have the feel that you're referencing, but mm. there's no, there's no toys about it, especially here at Rice. We implement a ton of technology on the pitching side, on the hitting side. You know, we have a Kinetrek system for both the pitching lab and then and our hitting facility where we can do the biomechanical analysis of all of our guys, right? And so, like, mm-hmm. that's that's like one end of the spectrum that we have access to, fortunately. And on the other end, it's like, okay, look, hey, we're going to go, we're going to have the scrimmage and or a coach's game and we're going to do a two-strike round and I'm going to try and get you out. And I need you to, I'm not worried about the way your body's moving. What I need you to do is get the guy in from third, right? Right. Um, and so there's there's an element of both. And I think at the end of the day, I definitely believe it for the college level. And I'm not sure I don't believe it all the way up to the big league level. But, you know, there's a huge element of like, give me the makeup over the ability, right? Because if the mm-hmm. guy, there's obviously a prerequisite level of ability that is you, you have to have. We all know that. That being said, um, the, the, the makeup is 
is pretty significant with regards to knowing who's going to show up every day. And, and, and mm. I would argue in a lot of cases, the guy who wants it more is going to have success the majority of the time. Um, mm. At least that's what I've seen. And that's what I think. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's a hard thing to quantify, obviously. So when you're asking about technology versus feel, I don't know, but yeah, um, I, th- I think that's a balance, but with regards to like who wants it more, I, you know, that's, you know, there's, there's that, that is the eye test that you're referencing, I think in a lot of cases. And, it's that that's going to win a lot of games mm, yeah oh yeah for sure i mean that's that's college baseball honestly right, like in right. a nutshell um right. and you touched on the technology side we will get to that at some point but you mentioned this sort of uh mental side a little bit you can call it the mental side i guess more so the guy that wants it more like you're talking about um mm-hmm. can you just talk about like, at least for your program like how you guys like to implement that it sounds like you do a lot of competitive situational stuff you know to sort of put guys in that atmosphere to see if they're you know going to show up or or not so to speak um so if you could just elaborate on that kind of installing that sort of like mental sort of bulldog mentality i guess you could call it into your players yeah so there's a couple answers like i mean our guys have access to you know we implement some uh, sports psychologists that that they have Mm. all have access to as well that yeah you know, and you're, I'm sure you've been exposed to a jacket the, in the Royals organization, but it's become prevalent at the pro level that they have they have somebody on staff, right? Every organization has somebody on staff that the guys have access to in some capacity. We have that. Our guys have access to that. Um, Coach Cruz is a big believer in that in his playing career and, mm. you know, is, is, is an advocate of it even for our guys, right? Um, mm. That being said, talking about, you know, on a daily basis, I think there's an element of terminology of culture that you just try to implement and again, it goes back mm-hmm. to saying you just reiterate it on a day day to day basis with regards to like I remember in the fall, early in the fall, we had a we have a player that was is a true sophomore that had a good freshman year, and we're in the cage trying to do execute some like hit and run type stuff. And it's early in the fall, like you could argue like what are we doing? It doesn't matter, right? And I lost I lost my mind, you know what I mean? I was like, hey, and I kicked him out of the cage and said, you know, I don't want to look at you, blah blah blah, right? But mm-hmm. um. And the only reason I use that that story or anecdote or whatever is just to say like it, it's 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 it has to be prevalent, right? It has to be is is frequent. We're not all going to be good every day, but we can all, you know, assuming that there's not like a significant life occurrence going on with immediate family or whatever, which we want to sympathize with something of that nature. But mm-hmm. don't don't give me that I was up late. Like I'm not worried about that. Like show up and give me the the hour in the cage or whatever that we got going. Um, so right. I think it's just something that you have to suffocate the program with in a good way is like, look, if, if it's a two strike round in September for, for the division one level, which, you know, there's nothing going on, or if we're getting ready to start our season next Friday and I'm trying to evaluate these last rounds of inner squads this weekend, like it, it's, it's not the same, but it's the same, you, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So, um, just yeah. stuff like that. We, we do a lot of, we do a lot of scrimmages like coach scrimmage, fungo game stuff and, and to implement, the same kind of stuff right and it's it's just uh the whole like you know how you do anything is how you do everything kind of thing mm-hmm. um it's, yeah. it's just it's just something that you try to try to create consistency with so that i always I always when i get mad at the end of a practice or whatever and i'm you know highlighting a couple of instances that happen whether it was in a scrimmage or whatever you know the terminology that i'll use is it's just because that's the way we do it you do it because that's just the way we do it whether it's running to first and touching the base after a rollover or, you know, whatever the example is, it's, it's just seemingly minute. It's like, Hey man, it's a big deal kind mm-hmm. of thing, you know? So I don't know. Yeah. That's probably a long winded, long winded answer. <laughs> no, that answers it for sure. I think it's safe to say that the quality of like a repetition or just the quality of how you do things probably supersedes the quantity. That's safe to say, right? Like it's really more about the quality than the quantity. Yeah, and, and I would attribute that to, you know, using, I, I use myself as an example to our guys a lot in the sense that, like, I was not the best player on any team I ever played on. Did I have the opportunity to play in the big leagues for six years over the course of nine? Yes, I did. But, and as, as funny as it sounds, like, I wasn't the best player on any team. Like, I now, when you're talking about that, I did create a routine and I could defend or whatever. But, like, so to your point about quality over quantity, now, don't get me wrong, I think there's an element of grind that, whether you're in a cage trying to mm-hmm. figure it out or whatever, taking ground balls or whatever the case is relative to a position player. 
I yeah. think those things are valuable, right? Because there's a psychological aspect that gets embedded into like, hey, man, I am working. I am putting the work in. Mm. I do I do deserve it. Now, that being said, as you continue to get farther down the road, you know, pro guys or whatever you want to say, they, they do develop a routine that they find that works for them. And that's their their psychological edge of saying like, OK, I know I'm right because I can. I can execute this off of this machine in the cage. And okay, so that knows I know my swing's right or vice versa. I know, you know, from a defensive standpoint, if you're a catcher, or infielder, outputter, whatever the whatever that routine is, but you feel good about it, it locks you in, so to speak. And you're like, I'm mm. good to go. That's all I need. I don't, I don't need 100. I just need 10 good ones, you know? Yeah. And you, and you mentioned the word routine. You know, that's something that comes up all the time on this podcast. Um, in terms of building routines, is it more about like the pre-practice, the pre-game routine that you try to kind of work up with your players? Because obviously it's hard to kind of hyper individualize when you're in a scrimmage, you know, or something like that. Like there really isn't like a routine that you have to build for that. So can you talk about just like routine building, maybe even specifically for the players that you work with day to day, you work with the infielders, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's difficult at the college level to individualize in some ways too, just because from a time constraint standpoint, you mm -hmm. know, if, if if I've got six or seven infielders at one time that we've got, you know, during our limited time, you, you've got an hour to work with these guys, right? So it's it's mm -hmm. not it's not exactly like you can do the one on one lesson in most cases. Like, do we do some of that? Sure. Like, I'll I'll put my glove on and still like go take some ground balls and and mess around with the guys, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but most of the time, it's developing the routine, so to speak, is is trying to create some consistency and in repetition with regards to like what I like to tell our guys is I want to make as many plays easy as we can. Like if you, if we make, if, if we make the routine plays and we get really good at it and if you can, you know, it's like the, the terminology is with, with the, from the golf standpoint is, you know, the best putters, you know, for making a three foot putt. Right. Um, but oh, yeah. making a making a three foot putt on Tuesday is different than making it on Sunday at the Masters, right? Well, is mm. it? I don't I don't know if it is. It's the same thing, but I mean, there's dang sure some different variables. But like you're accomplishing yeah. the same thing. So that to say, we, we do a lot of repetition, trying to make as many of the plays that you're going to make frequently, um, mm. and getting good at it, and just making it. I tell the guys I want it to be like breathing, like if you're playing third or whatever, and we're turning the double play the like I want that okay the ball's hit I know the runner on first I know the runner at the plate and you know I know my footwork and the stuff I just want it to be like breathing I don't want to I don't want there to be a ton of process so a lot of our practice relative to the infield stuff it, it is a little repetitive at times just especially this time of year because we're trying to like just type it in and we, we for, we're fortunate we have turf on our field now that was completed in November so this will be our first year with turf but that mm -hmm. makes the practice from a practice plan standpoint makes life a lot easier Interesting. That's so okay. Because uh, yeah, I'm thinking a bit like, you know, like college versus pro, especially too. like how difficult that is to kind of to kind of do. But, you know, it. I'm trying I'm trying to think of like how, how a kid like a high school kid right now, like how they can turn their routine and like bring that into college, even mm -hmm. though they have to, you know, kind of do what what you guys are able to do in like a limited capacity. So I'm trying sure. to think like what, what you would like tell a high school player or like a potential recruit to like work on, you know, before they get to rice, like in order to kind of maximize like their uh, preparedness. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? It's, it's kind of a difficult question to answer in some ways, just because mm -hmm. from, from a skill set standpoint, if you're just trying to get better, you know, let's just use an infielder as an example you probably need at least one other person. If you have a machine available that, or at a facility that has a machine and you can get somebody to put balls into a machine to throw you ground balls or somebody obviously that can physically hit them. But, mm. um, and then, so that's only one person. Now you got, got nobody to throw to. So like you need a net or something or something to aim at that kind of stuff. Right. Um, my answer to that would be like, try to try to what I was telling you, what I was referencing, try to make as many of the plays, that you're going to make like if you're a shortstop as many double play feeds to second throw the ball to first make your backhand make your forehand take infield take ground balls with, as if you're in the infield in mm. and just and just do those things as much as you can you know slow rollers and but then from my standpoint as a college recruiter you know i'm not going to really see you doing those things what i'm going to see is the result of those things at 
you know, the event that you are now playing on your travel team. And, and, and again, I go back to what I said earlier. Do I want you to be big, strong, and fast, hit the ball hard and throw it hard? Yes, I do, 100%. But there, you're going to tell me some things with your body language and with the way you get on and off the field and the way you walk out of the stadium after you go over three or whatever, you know. So mm-hmm. I'm not just watching the game when we go to those things. There's There's some other things that players tell you, whether they want to or not. Mm-hmm. In, in those elements now that's not entirely answering the hey how do you get better question I think the how do you get better question has to do with some of the things we we talked about right but yeah um but if you're if if why are you trying to get better because you want to play in college well how do you play in college well you, your presentation needs to be all-encompassing right there's some things that you can control outside of the skills that that, that tell a very large story if that makes sense Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you're touching on a very key point in terms of, you know, what those repetitions give you in the game. It's like that sense of I've been here before. It's like a level of confidence. And whether or not the kids know it, you guys see that almost like more it like it it almost stands out more than like a player's ability because, you know, you can watch one tournament and they go off or they don't do well, you know, but that's just one tournament. Like you probably need to see them a few more times. But if every single time their body language is like fantastic or it's not not super on par with what the standard is yep. like you're, you guys are going to identify that so much quicker it's so much easier to to figure out um so and, and now we're getting into like recruiting you know like high school and you know we can talk about like juco transfer portal stuff like that is that something that sticks out to you more so well not more so than like the playing ability because obviously there's kind of like a standard like we've talked about that you know in terms of the skill set but is that something, at least for you, when you go out and recruit, like that's something like you're really paying attention to? Yeah, you're talking about the there's the the presentation, so to speak. The presentation, yeah, the body language, like you're saying, the um, like how good of a teammate they are, kind of just the way they they carry themselves. Yeah, no, it's it's significant. And again, going back to Rice specifically, right? So the the place who we are and what we are, it 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 behooves us to to get guys that that check those boxes as well. We have trouble kind of, if a guy shows up here and, and, and isn't on board with all that we bring, meaning like, you know, the academic piece, the incorporated with the baseball piece. So when you're asking me about when I go watch guys, yeah, hundred percent, that's, you're going to, you're going to, in most cases now you're going to be able to tell. And like, I joke about it. It's, it's hard to not see it now. I can't even, yeah. you can't even, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to avoid it in some cases, even if you really like a player's ability, it's hard to not be able to tell that you think he may be uh, hard to deal with, I guess, at times, you know, relative to the, the off the field stuff. But, and, and we we're obviously going to talk to coaches and that kind of thing too. Um, the one thing that the transfer portal has, has brought is the ability to go get a 20 or 21 year old guy, you know, COVID created this situation where guys have an extra year. So we've had some, some success with some grad transfers. Um, mm-hmm. you, co- you coincide that with how goofy the draft has been for a couple of years. So like there's a bunch of guys still in college baseball that historically would not be right. Right. Um, and so all of those things combined, you say like, well, from a recruiting standpoint, I can go find an older guy that's got a little rubber on the road at the division one level, maybe a lot of rubber on the road and mm-hmm. uh, versus having to decide on a kid who's a sophomore in high school whether or not he's going to be good in four years, you know what I mean? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's the, it's not that hard of a decision and it's not really helping out the high school guys. Right. So mm-hmm. um, anyway, all that to say it's, it's there, there. So to answer your original question, yes, we're, we're paying attention to all of that stuff in particular a place like rise. Like w- would I evaluate people differently at a different place? Maybe, I, I don't know, I guess, but mm-hmm. I, know, I know, I know that my buddies that work at, the quote unquote big schools. I, I think that they're pretty, pretty big fans of the guys that do it the right way as well. In addition to being talented, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's funny though. I feel like uh, younger players maybe don't understand why it's so important. Can you just elaborate on like, why, like you don't have to give a crazy breakdown cause you kind of did, but maybe just why it's so much more important to be a high character guy coming in versus the yeah. guy who has a lot of talent and, you know, maybe is a little bit questionable on the character side. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll incorporate it. Like I referenced earlier, I have kids of my own, right? So my fifth grader and fourth grader are boys, and they both play baseball or, or whatever, sports in general. They're super active, mm-hmm. and, you know, I tell them and I lean on them, not so much about their ability or what they do right, 
um, it, it's there, you're learning a lot more at that age than baseball, right? You're learning how to act. You're learning if you are quote unquote, a good player on the team. Well, I want to know how you interact with the kid that can't play catch, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in, in little league, so to speak. So fast forward into, okay, now we're talking about high school ball. We're talking about travel ball that has become, you know, the, the bear that it has become. Um, and it, it goes back to saying like, there's just so few, I shouldn't say few, it's not as, as common anymore for a guy to say like, I'm just going to play better than the other guy. Okay, yeah, you're not playing shortstop on the best travel team and for us, Houston, Texas, or whatever the case is, or center field or catcher, whatever your position is, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to switch organizations, right? You you, you could just play better. Or <laughs> under, understand that, like, at some point, you're going to run into a situation where, like, somebody else is better than you. You know what I mean? Anyway, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm using that as an example to to – highlight the character part right like there's more to it mm -hmm. than just for the sake of your twitter page having to be the shortstop or, or whatever whatever the example is position wise but mm -hmm. um and it's it's just a it's, it's a selfless deal and you know uh, there, there's an element of guys where, where, where being a competitor inherently is selfish and i understand that because we 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 covet that as well the the ability to compete um yeah. So it, it is a fine line, like you said, but it, on the flip side, you know, I, I need somebody who's going to, we, we prefer to have guys that are going to say like, look, man, I don't care what glove it is. I don't care if it's big or small or, or it's funny and you got to play first, like give me a glove. Cause I want to be between the lines. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that overarching kind of mentality really, really will permeate a locker room in a good way. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it, Again, that it's long winded. I don't know if that totally answers the question, but it it's it, it's kind of it, it's it's kind of a a complex question, I guess. If that makes sense. No, yeah, it does. And you're bringing up a an interesting point to kind of at a younger level that you see more commonly at the college level. You know, the guys that were the best players in high school, and then they get to college, and it's like, okay, you're not. That's just how it is. Like for the most part, like most guys, mm -hmm. they don't get that. And you know, back then before the transfer portal was like, okay, you got, you know, you got punched in the face in the fall, like you got knocked mm -hmm. down, like, but you're not getting drafted this year, you know, like you got time. So just work on, you know, improving. And then in due time, like if you put in the work and, you know, you're, you're deserving of that success, it'll probably right. come to you. But now when you have transfer portal, now it's like kids, you know, if they don't like where they're at, they don't like the situation, they can just leave. And then you also bring that down to an even lower level. You got the kids, you know, in travel ball, you know, 9U, 10U, 11U, 12U, and then they get to high school and it's the same exact thing, but they're so much younger and they don't know how to deal with that adversity, you know? Now, okay. we don't have to talk about, you know, that problem, but in terms of the college level, I don't know what your experience was and maybe you can, you know, bring it back to yours as well. But if you could talk about what you like to tell the freshmen who are struggling maybe and mm -hmm. How, how they need to deal with that and how they should approach that and why it's so much more important to probably stay where you're at and just like probably buy into like whatever your you know program you're at as a freshman as opposed to trying to jump ship and go to the transfer portal yeah and and that's where I go I go back to like for us specifically like rice is it's a life decision in a lot of cases right like I, I wish more mm -hmm. people like with my own kids that's the way that I'm hoping that I will be able to maintain some sanity and look at it that way but mm -hmm. I see you're you're wearing a Tulane shirt right so it's like mm -hmm. it's it, it's a for Rice it's a life decision so like come here we're going to be vested in you you know assuming that you're not a delinquent while you're here but <laughs> yeah. we're going to be we're going to be vested in you for for three or four years hopefully and to your point like I I want you to be good as a freshman, but in this current landscape of college baseball, it's tough to do that. Yeah. Um, b because the, the average age of a starting player has gotten older. And that's, I don't know that that's going to change now that we do have the transfer portal. So understanding that like, it, it's, you know, it, it give me what you got, but understand it's going to be tough for an 18 year old to be as good at 18 as he's going to be when he's 20 or 21. Right. So like, mm -hmm you know if hopefully you get here and you know you, you can do that but it there's an element of you know stick to itiveness if that's what we want to call it that really yeah. really goes a long way um yeah and and so yeah it, it is it, it, but again that's 
for us specifically that's why i try to be honest on the recruiting visit right yeah i need you i need you to know what you're getting into and i'm dang sure not going to tell you that you're going to come here as a freshman and play because i'm not making that promise if if, if you show up and you're and you're able to do that great but in all likelihood you're not going to so me telling you or making you think that you're gonna is probably setting us both up for a miscommunication you know mm. so i think that is kind of the first line of defense so to speak and defending ourselves in the transfer portal and mm. look come here we're gonna I, you know what you're getting into i'm being honest with you on the front end and then that way when you get here as a freshman and it maybe it's okay there there are some variables school this and that traveling all the stuff mm-hmm. we'll show up as a sophomore now and in, in a lot of cases when a guy comes back as a sophomore he looks like a completely different guy just the look mm. on his face you know he's just more comfortable just like anything else just like you getting ready to go to spring training like it's it's more comfortable the more times you do it you just know what to expect right and so mm. um anyway the all of those things it's again there's a bunch of variables involved there but it uh it's 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 tough because at the end of the day you still have to recruit the guys that you have on campus but mm. but spending a ton of time worrying about that or, or is just it's a it's a relentless endeavor so to me it makes more sense to say like again this is who we are. This is how we roll. You know, we're, I'm going to do the best I can to be the same all the time relative to what I expect from you and the, how I communicate with you. Mm. Um, and if you don't hold it, if you're into the bargain, I'm going to tell you. And if you don't like that, well, then, you know, if you, if this ain't the place for you, that's okay, too. But <laughs> I'm, what I'm not going to tell you is you're going to come in and, you know, be the guy from the get-go and, and all the stuff. And just because, like, that's, that's just not being totally forthcoming, you know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot easier also to kind of, like, you know, say like, this is who we are, you know, as opposed to, you know, not giving them a very clear picture, you know, because yeah. then, then when it's like, okay, like, uh, we kind of told you this is how it was going to be anyway. <laughs> That's <laughs> like right. it's, yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, we've got, what is it like nine days until the season starts? Mm-hmm. Something like that. Maybe yeah. a little over nine days. Um, can you talk about what the team is looking like right now and kind of just how you guys are preparing uh, for literally next week? you know, for this first series against ULL? Yeah, we're playing Louisiana Lafayette to start. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, we're crossing our fingers that, you know, the pe- people stay healthy and that kind of stuff at this point. We're, I think we have a pretty good idea of kind of who's who, so to speak, going into the season. Now, we all know that things can change when the lights come on for good and for bad. So, like, we're mm-hmm. going to be ready to deal with that. But, um, a- again, going back to it with the second year head coach and, you know, new – some healthy roster turnover we're we're pretty excited about the season um we feel really good about kind of who we have like i said we're the nature of a place like rice is you know we're we need to stay healthy we're not going to have maybe as as deep of a roster as what some schools might but that's okay and um Mm. we we have a really good mix of guys who who who've been at some other places that maybe things didn't work out and some younger guys that are very talented that they both have one thing in common they they have they have they have something that they would like to prove so i'm really I'm really curious and excited to see how some of those stories unfold but um mm-hmm. you know like i said we this is my favorite time of year relative to the college game the the summer is super relentless with recruiting and the fall is fun but you know it's 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 just not the real games you know what i mean so like i'm i'm excited mm-hmm. about the real games this is kind of my favorite part of the job so to speak yeah and you guys have a pretty difficult schedule especially in the beginning i mean mm-hmm. yeah i mean yeah. uh what at stanford and then you have that tournament uh against you know a couple other texas schools the bigger like big texas schools as well yep. um how important is that to kind of battle test your guys early on you know so that n- not that your conference isn't strong you also have a pretty strong conference you know i'm looking sure. i was looking down the line earlier but how important is that to kind of like re- really prepare the, those guys in the first couple weeks kind of like say like hey it's go time day one like we're not messing around we're not easing into it here yeah it's um you know college baseball in general is deep right now and being in regionally where we are like it's very Mm. difficult to find teams that are not good so yeah um that to say the schedule early is very difficult there's no two ways about that you know for for me and for us you know like i said we we're we're we feel good about being prepared for the season um we're operating right now under a you know what do we really have to lose kind of deal like i I think that we got guys that want to compete and we're going to go play against good competition Mm. and you know 
we're going to do the best we can. And, and, and I think that to your point about being battle tested, I think as the season unfolds, even if, even if early on the season is difficult, that doesn't mean it's not going to go well, but it's dang sure going to be difficult. Um, it's going to pay itself off down the road. I, I mean, I, I do believe that. And so, and to your point, our conference is, is very, is very good relative to what maybe people think about it, if that makes sense. Oh um, yeah. It's uh, it, there's, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of let up there either. So, and, and like I said, because of where we are, I mean, we're playing Texas a and we're playing Baylor on our midweek games. We're going to play Sam Houston. Like we're, we're not, it's, there's just, there's, there's this part of the country just has a lot of good baseball and that's really fun, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now during the season, this is one thing I do want to ask because I feel like it doesn't get considered a ton, but for the players that aren't playing every day, that not, that are not getting consistent innings, what's your advice for those guys um, to kind of keep them ready? Yeah, it's a difficult thing to accomplish. I mean, we'll play some inner squads, mm -hmm. um, you know, during, during the week at times to try to keep some of that going. Um, but the the hard answer is like you got to figure out a way to stay ready best you can and look you and I both know there's no there isn't, there's no duplicate for playing in the games right there's no duplicate for live at bats or against a real guy in the seventh inning with a guy on second base you know what I mean like that's mm -hmm. that's that's tough to to duplicate but um we all at some point in our careers and lives have been presented with opportunities and you have to be ready for them and you have to take advantage and not everybody's opportunities are created equal. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. in your situation, your situation, you know, somebody that gets drafted in the first round is going to have a lot better opportunity than somebody that got drafted in the 18th round. You know, in, in our case, it's, it's the same, right? Like mm. de depending on how the fall went, like, look, you've created a situation where you're going to have to wait your turn. That may be a week and that may be three weeks. And you're not going to have the live reps and you're going to yeah. go in there against somebody that's, that's locked in really good and trying to take your job, so to speak. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's, again, we go back to it, right? Like how bad do you want it? Like it's, um, it's, 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 it's a tough endeavor. Um, mm. But, but it's, you know, and the people that get put in those situations, whether it's on our team or at the pro level, you, you have to, whether it's mental reps or whether it's visualization, those kinds of things, you have to find a way to do it. And at the end of the day, like when you get the opportunity, whether it's one at bat or whether it's, you know, 20, mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta do what you can. Yeah. I want to ask now about yourself, just, mm -hmm. you know, we have a little bit of time left. I want to, I want to dive into you as, as much as I can in this short time. Um, did you always want to be a coach? Did you know you wanted to be a coach from a young age? Um, do you have someone that drew you towards coaching uh, before you started? Uh, so, no, I did not think I was going to be a coach. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. My having gone to Rice, you know, we have a lot of alumni network and whatnot that has obviously been financially very successful. I had, I had always envisioned that that's the route that I was going to go in some capacity, whether it was finance or real estate or whatever, right? Um then find figure out that I'm have the ability to play professionally, do that deal, and you work as hard as you can for a long time to to keep a job, right? To get to get to the big leagues and and that kind of thing. And so that took up a you know a large portion of my of my life. And you know I was had to come finish my degree. And so fortunately I was I came back to Rice to complete my degree, and I was on campus at 35 years old for the first time in a while. And, <laughs> um helping out with the team and man I, it 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 you know you hear people say like it chose me versus i chose it it you know i had zero intention necessarily at that juncture of being a coach and or a college coach and i would have told you before if i was going to be in coaching it may have been at the pro level but I, mm. I've, I've i've grown to really like it I like the the age group that we deal with i really really love rice um so it's easy for me to sell this place because i know mm if you show up and you're not any good at baseball, that's probably my fault. But if worst case scenario, Rice is going to set you up pretty good for life. So it, it makes me, um, you know, with regards to, you know, doing the sales pitch, so to speak on the recruiting trail, it's, mm. it's, it, it's easier for me to do that because there's some, there's, there's some, you know, changing lives that is associated with coming to a place like this, you know? Mm. I would imagine, you know, uh, some hidden gems about Rice having been around it so long. Can you give me like a little hidden gem about Rice University that maybe people don't know about? It can be, you know, a, a spot to eat. It can just mm -hmm. be like, a, you know, a place to go visit. I don't know, something like do, um, you have, do you have one that comes to mind. 
so there's there's a lot of cool stuff about rice the um the hidden mm -hmm. gem so to speak is for maybe more of the adult humor is we have uh there's a, a graduate slash faculty bar on campus so rice is the only huh. campus in texas um how that how we accomplish that i have no idea but, <laughs> um anyway so it's, it's kind of one of the rice you know the the, the lore so to speak is hmm. you know like the the, the draft beers are still like 75 cents right from back in the oh, day oh wow whatever. um anyway when i when i say bar we're talking about like a closet okay this place is like a, a dungeon closet oh wow um, um on campus but it's uh it's it's cool and that's just one example but there's a, there's a lot of cool things about rice it's a super unique place um mm -hmm. you know with, with a really really unique strong network and like i said t talking about it earlier it, it it changes lives which is which is really cool because it um it does it does set you up in a unique way hmm. is there something about the program that not a lot of people would know about that that you are particularly fond of um just uh the fact that you know historically for a lot of times we've been one of the smallest from a population standpoint smallest division one schools in the country hmm. and uh you know obviously we won the national championship in 2003 and from for a large part of you know, a 15 to 20 year period, we we're, you know, from a win standpoint, one of the best programs in the country. And that's a unique thing to have accomplished at a place like this, right? So we're, uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to continue to promote that and, and um, deal with some of the current speed bumps relative to recruiting and college sports in general, and, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and kind of reestablish the program as a place that you can get a great degree, have a great life and a unique baseball experience and have the opportunity to hopefully to go to Omaha. Interesting. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing like being part of a program that's on the rise, too. That's always a good feeling, you know, at least. Sure. Yeah. Um, OK, I got two questions left. Um, yeah. First one, if you go back in time to your first year coaching self, what piece of advice uh, would you give yourself? Um, going back to it, I kind of referenced it earlier, but it mm. would be um, give them a little less leash, like be more direct right now. Like, let's just mm. go ahead and get, let's go ahead and get this going. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that would, that would definitely be, be the advice I would, I would give. Okay. That, that's short. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you made a point of it earlier and like you said, the communication side, I mean, we can, we can talk about that forever. Um, all right. Last question. This is about a recruiting visit. You know, if you have a, mm -hmm. you know, a story you'd like to share about a memorable recruiting visit, something that happened while you were maybe out on a trip, um, it could be, you know, funny. It could be, you know, just a horror story. Honestly, I had one a week or two ago. It could, it could be a train wreck. It could be a success story. Really, anything. If you have any recruiting visits that, that um, come, kind of come to mind to kind of illustrate the job that that you uh, that you have. So the the best recruiting. This isn't a visit. This is a trip that I had to, that mm -hmm. was going on. So we had a I had a guy that I was going to go watch. A kid from I'm in Houston, right? A kid from Oklahoma. There was an event and. Mm. whatever whatever it was Tulsa or something it was it was in Oklahoma at one of the one of the events and smart kid infielder blah 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 right so yeah I fly up to watch him play specifically and I get there and I'm watching a t what's going to be a like a three-day event right well the first day I'm there I'm watching the game that he's playing and he he walks gets on base right gets the second base hit he's coming home to score slides into the catcher and gets hurt right he comes out he comes <laughs> out of the game he comes out of the game and i'm like you know texting what would happen well, I, you know dislocated a finger or whatever it was and so he's not gonna be able to play the rest of the time and i'm like well this <laughs> sucks like this came up here pretty much just to see this kid um meanwhile via twitter or whatever like literally within two hours he's committed to another university and i'm like god this is like the worst case scenario ever oh my like, gosh we flew up here to see him specifically because he really wants to potentially go to rise because he's an academic kid. And within the span of about six hours, he can't play and he's committed to another school. I'm like, hmm, this is not how I had this drawn up. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh my God. But college coaches would appreciate it because we, they understand that how goofy the recruiting landscape can be at times with regards to chasing kids like that. And it's, it's just uh, it, it'll drive you nuts. Right. Oh man, yeah, we could talk about recruiting. I feel like forever. I mean, just being in the position that you guys are in. Um, but yeah, I mean that that's all I have for you. I mean, at least for now. I know you you have to probably go soon. Uh, we talked about it before, but yeah, I just want to say, you know, to kind of 
you know, bring it home. Just thank you for coming on. You know, I really appreciate you know, you taking the time to talk about the program and kind of, you know, your experience so far and um, what it's like to be a player, you know, at Rice University. No, Jack, I appreciate the time, man. And uh, good luck to you moving forward as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you really briefly after we sign off. But yeah, that's going to do it for this episode of Player to Prospect. And uh, yeah, we will uh, see you next week.